Welcome to episode four of KCC TV, the magazine show made by members of Kendall Cycle Club. I'm Karen G and with me today, as always, is Ben Dowman. Hi, Ben. Hi, Karen. Welcome to episode four, everyone. We've got a fantastic episode coming up with some different items in this show. Uh, what have we got coming up, Karen? First up, we've got Me and My Bike by Michael Eden. Then we've got the results of last month's Climb Challenge with some outrageous <laughs> beach photos at the top of Windfell. You might have seen some on Facebook. They are insane. Absolutely brilliant. People yeah. went mad, I think. Yeah. yeah, so creative. Following that, we've got the challenge for this month. And then we've got a short film about bikeability. And then we're going to meet a couple of our committee members. And then finally, we have a feature all about the Lakeland, Lakeland Lane Quest events, which are going on right now, which might inspire you to take part. So first up, our first feature is Me and My Bike. Um, and Michael Eden is going to tell us all about his bike and why cycling is so important to him. Hello, oh, my name is Michael Eden and I've been a member of Kendall Cycling Club for a number of years and what you see here is my first lightweight bike. It's a Bates, probably from the 1950s or early 60s, which I bought from a Kendall friend in the late 70s. It has unusual cantiflex, cigar-shaped tubing and diadrant forks. My brother took it over to Austria for a few years, but as you can see now, it is sadly in need of restoration. I've had other bikes since, including this Hewitt, but what I really want to show you is my pride and joy. And here it is. It was made for my 60th birthday about six years ago by Matthew Souter of London. It's made of Reynolds 853 Philip Bray's tubing and was created to be light, nippy and comfortable for all day riding. I designed the paint scheme to emulate a Eurostar flashing across the French countryside. Though the bike hasn't yet been on the train, I have taken it to France a number of times, including for a wonderful trip from Caen on the Channel Coast to Nice on the Côte d'Azur. I've also taken it to the west coast of America, into the hills east of Los Angeles. Alongside these trips, the bike has played a significant role in my work as an artist. I use complex 3D software to create artworks frequently based on historic ceramics. There are often technical issues to overcome and I now realise that cycling is part of my creative process if that doesn't sound too pretentious. When faced with a difficult problem, I will sometimes leave the computer and go for a ride and whilst apparently completely focused on enjoying the surrounding countryside, an answer to the issue will suddenly pop into my head, seemingly out of nowhere. So riding my saffron not only brings me a great deal of pleasure, it is also my muse. I think that film just sums up what cycling's all about really, isn't it? I mean, the bike is what you use, but actually cycling just helps you sort of go to a different place. And I know I'm often stuck at my desk and then I go out for a ride and inspiration strikes. Yeah, I mean, pe people cycle for lots of different reasons, mm -hmm. don't they? And of course, we talk a lot about mental health, but I think this is a different aspect to kind of problem solving and getting ideas. And, yeah, and creativity. Creativity. Yeah. I, I love what Michael's talked about there. Yeah, absolutely. And his bikes. And his bikes. Of course. And it was very topical that he had a photo of him on top of Mont Ventoux because mm -hmm. we're seeing Mont Ventoux in the Tour de France right now for everyone that's watching it. So yeah. that's, that's on topic. Excellent. <laughs> so... Last month's climb of the month was Windfell, and Pete Elwood gave us a great piece about that. And loads of people have been taking part in the challenge and riding up Windfell on road bikes, on gravel bikes, on mountain bikes. And so we are going to pull a name out of the hat from everyone who has taken part and done the climb this month. So. Karen, I've got all the all the names in the bubble hat. If yeah. you'd like to choose KCC bubble hat, let me a see. Winner. Oh gosh, there's a lot in there. I know, I know there's loads. <laughs> yeah. Right, who is it? It is Dave Walton. Congratulations, Dave. Also to mention uh, a special mention for Matt Loughlin, who was fastest up there this month. Oh, very yeah. good. 
Well done, Matt. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, let's talk about the challenge we set last month about going to the beach. I have to say, when you told me your idea, I thought nobody's going to do this. And I was so wrong. <laughs> We have been absolutely amazed by the, the objects that people have taken up to the top of Winfolk. We've had rubber dinghies. Tents. Beach balls. Um, ice creams. Ice creams. What are those things? Beach towels. Beach towels. Sand to make sand persons. A swimming pool. Rubber rings. Rubber ducks. <laughs> it works. So we're going to show you a quick <laughs> montage now of, of what people did. As you can imagine, it's been really hard to choose a winner from all the entries into the beach photo competition. Karen, what, what impressed you the most? Ice creams at the top. <laughs> Fake ones, real ones. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say, the thing that's, that swung it for me was people actually carrying sand on their bikes <laughs> up that hill to make a sandcastle with KCC flags in. I know, it's just incredible. And it was actually Shah Dixon and Christine Fisher who made the sandcastle and had Cornettos on the top. That is impressive. So Shah and Christine, you are our winners. And I just think, Ben, if there was a CCT camera on the top of that um, station up there and there's some person sitting somewhere in an office just checking like looking at sheep and looking at hills and stuff and then suddenly like all these people come up and start stripping off and getting into tents and doing synchronized swimming I was just think what on earth is going on <laughs> maybe we've secretly livened up someone's yes. really boring <laughs> office surveillance let's, job yes let's hope so <laughs> so what are we doing this month Ben so this month's Climb of the Month is brought to us by Zoe North, aged 13, one of our junior members, and her dad, Adrian North. So let's watch. Zoe, why have you chosen Toe Top? On a ride with my dad and a friend, we got to the bottom and decided to challenge ourselves. I surprised myself and my and dad by managing the two steepest hairpins. So what do you like about the climb? I like the challenge and to watch dad struggle. I got a like on Instagram from James Knox too. I like Toe Top as well because it is it is a challenge. The first time I rode it was on the Club Sportive and uh, I don't think I'd have made it if it hadn't been for a helping hand on the last corner. What would you say to somebody who wants to ride Toe Top? Hit the bottom at 
speed, go for your lowest gear, zigzag it if you can and take the outside of the corners and leave some energy for the straight bit at the end. It's deeper than it looks. Well done Zoe. We, we love the fact that you're making your dad struggle up that hill. So Adrian, you're going to have to get a bit faster I think to keep up with her. So Ben, have you ridden that climb? I have ridden that toe top and uh, I actually think it's a hard climb. Mm -hmm. It's 20% the gradient. And I actually really impressed Zoe with, with what you did there. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I go up it, I think this feels hard. Yeah, yeah, looked at. So the challenge this month, there are two challenges. And the first challenge is simply to ride the climb. This, is, this will be the steepest climb we've had in our challenges. And I think actually for a lot of people, just getting up it. That's no mean feat, is it? It, 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 you yeah. know, it is really a challenge. So you know, if you can just go out and ride up toe top, send us a photo or let us know you've done it and you'll be in the draw. But if you are feeling like you really want to push yourself, then I have created a new Strava segment, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is three times up toe top. <laughs> Up, down, up, down, up. No one's done it. I've created it and no one has ever ridden it. So oh. this is literally laying down a challenge that hasn't been done on Strava before. I don't know if anyone's going to do it. My guess is people will. I think people will. And there'll be some King of the Mountains and Queen of the Mountains. Absolutely. But, yeah. So we'll look forward to seeing what happens. Next up, we've got a film about bikeability and the provision that Kendall Soccer Club have been putting on recently. So, Brian, what can people expect to learn on a course with you to, today? Um, so, level three bikeability, um, we look at kind of four main areas really. Uh, we're looking at um, road positioning, which is really, really crucial when you're in town. Uh, communicating to the road users, so letting people know exactly what we're doing. Uh, checking, looking, uh, making sure we're looking in the right direction. And then just understanding a little bit about our rights as a cyclist and where we can be on the road and, 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 and how the road works. I think the main thing was road position, wasn't it? Yeah. The uh, primary and secondary positions, uh, claiming your part of the road. And have you managed to put that in pra into practice in actual rides? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, especially on busy junctions uh, when there's roundabouts, more than one exit and entry into that roundabout is where you should be safely and you know you have a right to be there and having the confidence to be in that position. How long do um, people tend to spend with you on the course on a day? Level 2 bikeability depends on numbers but anything from two hours upwards to a full day if we've got a larger group. We tend to look at, um, yeah we tend to look at a road situation, we will then demonstrate. How much um, does this cost? How much will it cost for somebody to come on the bikeability course? Uh, it's free. Um, Could you say that again please? It's free. It's free. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that is brilliant. Brilliant. What would you say to encourage somebody to take up this free offer? Um, well, if you can ride your bike, get it out of the shed, get yourself down to bikeability. Um, it isn't all getting thrown in at the deep end. We will start with some, uh, some basic skills uh, and build it up from there. And each course that we do tends to be tailored towards what individuals need. So bring what you can and we'll work with that. You think you know everything, but you don't. Or adults, a lot of adults cycling think they're confident, but they're not actually using the right road positions. So please take it up. Yes, again, yes, definitely take it up. It is worthwhile just honing the skills that you already have, um, and it's worth doing, absolutely. I don't know about you, Karen. But I didn't really know what bikeability was mm -hmm. until I saw that interview. Yeah, I knew about it because my kids had done it at school, but I didn't really realise that adults could do it as well. Yeah, and actually it was really great to hear from Susan and Jane that they found it so valuable in terms of learning mm -hmm. about road positioning. I think actually it's really helpful for people to understand what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. And it's worth saying that there's still spaces on the July course. The 31st of July course still has spaces remaining. If you're interested, go on the KCC website and you can find out more there. And it's free. And it's free. What more do you want? <laughs>
Next up, we are meeting not one, but two committee members this month. Um, the role that we're looking at is welfare officer, and this is a really, really important role. And um, we're going to hear more from Simon Frost and Christine Nelson about what it is that they do. Hi, I'm Simon Frost. I'm one of the Kendall Cycle Club welfare officers, together with Christine Nelson. Hi, I'm, I'm Christine Nelson. Um, I'm one of the welfare officers for Kendall Cycle Club. I've been a member now for uh, just over five years, joined in January 2016, and I've, I'm in my second year of office on, on the committee. I've been a member for four years and I've been on the committee for two years now. I've been cycling now since 2006. We were as a family of family cyclists before that. I've perhaps taken up cycling a bit more seriously since 2006. Um, I tend to ride mainly on the road. Um, I have a gravel bike which causes great amusement to those who ride with me um, and uh, I, I vary on the road between a fixed wheel bike and my more conventional geared road bike. I have, I've been cycling for years, many years. Um, I used to do a bit of touring years gone by in, on some pretty old heavy bikes but I bought my first road bike in 2014 first bike with drop bars that was quite a thing for me um, and I've done a lot of road riding since then I was I was training for a, um, a charity fundraiser from Blackpool Tower to Paris with work and, um, and since then I now have a hardtail mountain bike and a gravel bike and, and through the lockdown period I've explored so much more off-road and improved off-road so um, I kind of feel that the gravel bike is is inching into first place because it's so versatile for touring and off-road so it's great. Christine and I are responsible for managing and reporting uh, to appropriate professional bodies in total confidence any concerns that are brought to us about children and or adults at risk of abuse. Um, and it's our role to put into place safeguarding procedures and, and make sure that um, the reporting procedures are followed. We work in complete confidence, free of any associations within the club and any information shared with myself and Simon is treated equally and without any judgment. Um, and it's, it's everybody's responsibility in the club actually to, to be aware of safeguarding and to ra raise any issues with myself and Simon if, if they thought that something needed to be raised and looked into or reported further. I think what attracts me most about KCC is that it is a one of these new cycling clubs that is not founded on racing so it has a much wider inclusion of cyclists of a whole variety of temperament and ability and it and it provides for all those people so I get I get friendship I get um, fitness and I get guilt-free coffee and cake I like, I like the the friendship and the inclusivity of the um, of the club. Um, I'm a big believer of. Um, it's not about speed and it's not about the most expensive bike. It's about everybody's journey, however long it takes. Um, the stopping at the roadside and helping with punctures and and all that sort of forgetting your wallet and blagging a coffee off somebody, you know. And, and, and the challenges lately um, that have, have, have come out the TV um, that the club's doing, I think are really, really inspiring and great for pulling people together and getting them out in little teams. Um, that I think that, you know, it's just such a social platform and, and so, so inclusive. Thank you, Simon and Christine. That was really informative.
And have you noticed how every conversation right now seems to turn to gravel cycling, Karen? It does, doesn't it? Yes, it's everywhere. Everyone's on gravel at the moment. And I think, Ben, it's such an important role as well. When I was um, involved with the juniors, um, I always used to think that welfare office is one of those roles that ideally nobody needs to know is there. And if everything's going smoothly and they're doing the stuff behind the scenes, um, hopefully you, you don't need them. But it's such an important role if something happened. Um, that it's so good to know that Christine and Simon are there. And it's worth saying that if you are ever in need of the welfare officer, go straight to the Kendall Cycle Club um, webpage and there'll be details there on how to make contact with them in complete confidentiality. Our final feature of this episode is all about the Lakeland Lane Quest. I can say it now, Karen. And uh, Tim Price went to Staveley to the event to find out more. Hello, my name's Tim Price and I'd like to introduce you to Lakeland Lane Quest. What's Lakeland Lane Quest, Tim? What's that all about? Well, good question. Follow me and let's find out. Lane Quest is bike orienteering on country lanes and in particular the lanes of the stunningly beautiful English Lake District. An ordnance survey map, usually a 1 to 50,000 scale is provided. The map is marked with 30 controls which are distributed across the map area. Each control is worth 10 points and each competitor aims to visit as many of the controls as they can within a two hour time limit. Oh, and this year, for the first time, there is an e-bike category. Riders are free to decide which route to take and which controls to try to reach in the time allowed. There is no set order in which the controls are visited and riders decide on the most efficient way in which to use their time and energy. The ride culminates in a total score for each rider, pair or group. Riders can return to the finish area any time within their allowed time limit. There are no penalties or bonuses for returning early. If the rider is late returning to the finish area, points are deducted on a rising scale from their total score. The rider or group with the highest points total after deductions is the winner. If there is a tie on the final scores, the rider with the lower riding time is awarded the higher finishing place. Lane Quest is enjoyed by riders of different ages, different riding fitness levels and technical riding abilities. Basic map reading skills are required and this improves as riders take part in more events. Decision making on the fly gives riders much enjoyment and the ability to change the planned route as the event progresses to match time and energy remaining is also a great feature of the events. Riding in pairs can also help those not so confident with the map. Clearly, a combination of fitness, riding technique, good map reading skills and wise route choice tend to be characteristics of the top riders. Riders are divided into the following classes. Men solo, women solo, pair or group. There is also a generation category in which the younger members of the family, 12 plus, can be introduced to the sport where they can ride with an adult rider and learn about map reading whilst improving their fitness. So the generation pair is 18 plus and under 16. There's junior, which is 16 to 17, and then there's young junior pair, 12 to 15. A control consists of a number plate and a means of marking your control card, such as an electronic or manual punch. They're wired onto clearly marked features, which are usually footpath or bridleway signs. When you arrive at a control, punch your card and head off for the next one. Bit nervous. 
going to be hilly. Yeah, but you've done this course before, have you? Well, well no, not this exact course. Not the exact one, but Stapley wasn't very good the last time I did it. How good did you get, I think? 18. 18. 18. Well yes. Done. Yeah, thank and you. What time yeah. have you done it in? Bang on two hours. How many checkpoints did you get? 19 for me. Excellent. Good one. Didn't get as many as I wanted. How many did you get? Yeah, let's have a look. Twenty. Oh, well done. That'll do. Well done. And the, and what time have you done it? Uh, one hour fifty-seven, I think. I really enjoyed that film, Ben. I thought it, it was brilliant. And it explained to me what Lanequest is because I know a number of times people have said to me, oh, you should do Lanequest with your boys. I thought it was going to be a lot more competitive with a lot more sort of really fast cyclists, but actually you need to be able to read a map, you need to be able to choose a route and you need to ride your bike. So it sounds as a sort of a, a real mix of skills. Yeah, absolutely. I've done Lanequest and um, there's some people who are, who are being really competitive, mm -hmm. but actually it's not about riding your bike fast. Mm -hmm. I was usually zooming around on my bike, completely misreading the map and being a bit of a headless chicken <laughs> and watching other people ride more slowly, but actually end up going past me because because they're reading the map. <laughs> you know where they're going, yeah. You know where they're going. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, there's that aspect to it, but there's also people who are, are out to enjoy a nice evening. Mm -hmm. You get to maybe ride in a new place and do it in a pair or do it on a tandem. There's people doing it in all sorts of different mm -hmm. ways. It's just a great fun and great atmosphere. And is it always at Staveley? No, it's actually, the, each event is at a different location. So mm -hmm. there's six events in the series and they're, they're around the South Lakeland area. So there's still a few events left on a Tuesday evening if you fancy going along. Have a go. I think we've got one item of KCC news this month, haven't we, Ben? We do, and it's it's a call out for people who would be willing to help out with the juniors. Uh, we've got a lot of juniors in the club, and it's an incredibly important part of the club of, of helping our younger members progress with their cycling and get involved in their cycling. Uh, if you'd be willing to contribute, then the club are going to put on a level one coach course, which is paid for. And uh, this is really thinking about for coaching next year. So please get in touch with the committee or have a look on the Facebook page if you'd be willing to get involved. And it's a really worthwhile thing. You get a lot of satisfaction from seeing these children progress and get better than you usually <laughs> pretty quickly. <laughs> so I think, Ben, we've run out of time. We have, Karen. Oh. I think it just remains for us to thank everyone who's contributed to the episode. Yes, we've had a lot of help this week. Um, we've had Michael Eden, Adrian and Zoe North with their challenge. Sue Little, Jane Cregan and Brian from Bikeability. We've had Christy Nelson, Simon Frost, uh, Tim Price uh, gave a lot of help with two of the features, particularly the Lane Quest one and the Bikeability. So, uh, episode's been produced by Pete Elwood and Ian Charles, and also a big thank you to Paul Bowsden from Matt Deck, who's helped us with camera and technical stuff. And before we go, we need to talk about the next episode. We do. And we really want to ask for uh, people to get involved in two different ways. Uh, the first is, if you have an idea for a feature that you'd like to suggest or like to do, maybe you're going somewhere interesting on your bike and you'd like to share some photos and tell a story about your trip, Perhaps you'd like to get involved and do a climb of the month or my bike and what it means to me or share a recipe. Then please get in touch. You don't need lots of uh, skills with cameras or editing. We can help with all of that. And on that topic, there's also the opportunity to get involved behind the scenes in producing the episodes and learning new skills. Um, everyone who's involved in this is um, a volunteer and started completely from scratch. None of us really had any um, any experience and I hope you're seeing each um, episode we're getting slightly better we're learning how to do things a bit better um, so if you think that you can um, you, you might already know this have the skills and be able to contribute or if you want to learn them um, it's a really great way to um, sort of develop those skills um, if you're interested then do drop us a line at tv at kendall.cc or just drop us a message on Facebook we hope you've enjoyed the episode as ever, the next episode will be out on the first Monday of the month. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>